This is a map of every U.S. drone strike in Somalia from 2011 to 2022. There are 267 known strikes on this map, and many more that may never be confirmed, performed by the CIA and hidden by the U.S. government. The U.S. has been fighting a covert war in East Africa for over 16 years. This includes troops on the ground, conducting operations, training of militia groups, and yes, drone strikes. All in the name of fighting a militant Islamic terrorist organization named Al-Shabaab. But critics say that the history of U.S. policy in Somalia is riddled with missteps that have weakened the state and strengthened militant groups who seek to control the country. And it's possible that the U.S. and Somali government are walking into another situation like Afghanistan and Vietnam. So why is the U.S. still at war in Somalia? What do U.S. policymakers hope to gain? And has there been any progress towards ending another of America's forever wars? So some history. In 1993, the United States was leading a UN mission in Somalia, trying to bring an end to the civil war that started when the previous dictator was ousted by rebel forces. In October of that year, two Black Hawk helicopters carrying American troops were shot down while conducting a raid on a powerful Somali warlord in an event now known as Black Hawk Down or the Battle of Mogadishu. It cannot be overstated enough how this event changed the course of U.S. policy in Africa and changed the direction of the country. 18 Americans were killed. There was footage of militia members dragging American bodies through the streets. And within six months, the U.S. had fully withdrawn troops from Somalia. During this period of total state collapse, regional Islamic courts sprung up across the country, particularly in the capital of Mogadishu, in an effort to restore order, manage crime, and provide social services, though they also implemented Sharia law. So around the year 2000, with no legitimate central government in place, the courts would fully unite. They formed the Islamic Courts Union, which took complete control over Mogadishu and became the de facto government. Islamic militants have seized Mogadishu in Somalia and they're expanding control across the country. It's a prospect that terrifies the West. But the Islamic Courts Union was never recognized by the international community and neighboring countries didn't want Islamic extremists to control the country, particularly Ethiopia. So in 2004, the transitional federal government was formed in Nairobi which international and regional partners recognized as the legitimate government of Somalia. But this new government couldn't regain control over the capital from the Islamic Courts Union. They weren't powerful enough. They didn't have enough military force. So in 2006, Ethiopia invaded. They sent 50,000 troops into Somalia to assist the government forces, and they succeeded. The U.S. government provided support to Ethiopia during the conflict, including intelligence and air support, and leaked documents actually show that U.S. policymakers pushed Ethiopia to invade and wanted this transitional federal government to take power. This policy choice had two unfortunate consequences. First, the Somali federal government was never able to effectively govern the entire country. They were viewed as a patron government to Ethiopia by Somalis, and the government is still racked with corruption and lacks legitimacy. Second, as Ethiopian and Somali forces took back Mogadishu, the defeated Islamic Courts Union splintered into several extremist militia groups, one of which is known as Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab was originally a faction of the Islamic Courts Union that broke off after being ousted from Mogadishu. After fleeing the capital, they launched a guerrilla war against Ethiopian and Somali forces for years while they consolidated their power. Like many extremist groups, Al-Shabaab's broad goal is to establish an Islamic state in Somalia. In areas they control, they banned non-Islamic behaviors and implemented brutal punishments, including stoning, beheading, and amputations. By 2008, Al-Shabaab had thousands of recruits and exerted significant control over southern Somalia. They used the U.S. war on terror as a tool for their recruitment of other radicalized Muslims, and the U.S. State Department eventually designated them a terrorist organization that year. Remember, this all took place during the war on terror, 
While the Obama administration had formally stopped using the phrase War on Terror, the US military was still pursuing Al-Qaeda globally, and Al-Shabaab declared themselves allies of Al-Qaeda in 2010, which meant the US was back in Somalia once again. The first US drone strike in Somalia happened in June of 2011, and by 2012 Al-Shabaab had pledged formal allegiance to the Al-Qaeda network. They were conducting major terror attacks across the region, bombings against civilians, businesses and embassies, and performing political assassinations. So when President Trump took office, it didn't take long for the conflict to ramp up further. In 2017, Trump approved a DoD proposal to give the military more control over when and where to strike in Somalia. This meant more drone strikes with less approvals needed and a lot less concern for civilian casualties. Trump dramatically increased U.S. involvement in the conflict via drone strikes while pulling out the small amount of troops that were present in Somalia. In 2019, the Trump administration conducted 93 drone strikes in Somalia, which is more than during the entire Obama administration. And at this point, it's worth noting that there was never any congressional approval for the war in Somalia. Makes you think. So while the American political consciousness was focused on high-stakes wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the U.S. waged a covert war in Somalia. And what was the outcome? What did 16 years of ground raids, training of Somali forces, and drone strikes actually produce? Well, critics and supporters of the war differ on their account of whether the U.S. had any positive impact in Somalia at all, but let's review some key facts. The U.S. intelligence community annual threat assessment for 2022 made reference to al-Shabaab and the Somali government. In their opinion, in Somalia, leaders' myopic focus on politicking has led to government paralysis, widening the opening for al-Shabaab and raising the risk of recurring outbreaks of violence in Mogadishu. Translation, the local government, which was propped up by the U.S. government for nearly two decades, is ineffective and corrupt. The government is perceived by locals as predatory, and sustained almost exclusively by outside actors, which isn't shocking. The government was convened in Nairobi, set in place by the US and Ethiopia, and has spent years failing to affect policy changes to improve civilian lives. In fact, far from it. The Somali government has consistently violated human rights, carrying out executions across the country, and cracking down on protests against them with lethal force. Al-Shabaab controls large portions of central, southern, and western Somalia, and the areas that they don't explicitly control are considered fluid. Here's a map that estimates the areas of control, with Al-Shabaab territory in red and contested territory in tan. Compare that to territory maps from 2017, can you tell the difference? Does this look like a terrorist organization that's being pushed back or degraded? According to European Union reports for 2022, Al-Shabaab effectively runs a parallel shadow government throughout Somalia, including in the capital of Mogadishu. Citizens regularly turn to Al-Shabaab as an alternative provider of justice because the government doesn't have the capacity to run an effective court system. Al-Shabaab collects their own taxes using a remarkably complex system, dividing the southern part of the country into 10 distinct regions that all generate revenue for them. This is done through checkpoints, business extortion, import taxes at major seaports, and these taxes are even paid by members of the Somali federal government so that they won't be targeted. According to official reports, Al-Shabaab has infiltrated both the Somali federal government and the security forces at all levels. And in 2019, they perpetrated another attack that made this clear, when the mayor of Mogadishu was killed in a suicide bombing perpetrated by two of his own staff. And to make matters worse, the Somali federal government is currently in the process of shooting itself in the foot. Remember that U.S. intelligence quote from earlier, the myopic focus on politicking? That's referring to the current election crisis. The government that was put in place by the U.S. and Ethiopia in 2006? They've never once held a popular election. In fact, there hasn't been a popular election in Somalia since 1969. The current government was set to hold the first popular election in decades in 2021, but delayed the process due to political infighting. The president's term expired in 2021, but then he went ahead and approved a two-year extension for himself generously, which led to further political battles in the government. 
This delay has led to protests, violence, and of course, Al-Shabaab is taking advantage by launching attacks in the midst of the chaos while the government continues to lose its grip on the situation. Al-Shabaab is seemingly as strong as they've ever been. Okay, so that was a lot of information, but it's important to get the full picture. Somalia is in the midst of a protracted civil war, and the conflict has never really ended. U.S. forces have been fighting a terrorist group instead of recognizing that they're up against a social phenomenon, and the strategy hasn't worked. And in many ways, it's actually strengthened al-Shabaab and left average Somalis much worse off. In general, civil wars don't end with absolute victories, and it's pretty clear in this case that an absolute victory with a fully realized Somali federal government is probably not an option. Which critics would say means it's time to consider negotiating peace with al-Shabaab. Wait, negotiate with terrorists? This might be the one rule of US foreign policy that seemingly everyone knows. The US does not negotiate with terrorists. Well, until they do. The US has negotiated with terrorist groups to secure the release of hostages in the past. The US negotiated with the Taliban in Afghanistan. And the fact is, al-Shabaab represents an entrenched ideology with deep roots in Somali society. While more extremist members of al-Shabaab have perpetrated horrific attacks against civilians, other moderate elements of the group have been successfully negotiated with in the past. Experts think that it might be time for the US to dramatically rethink its strategy in Somalia, and negotiating a peace between the Somali federal government and al-Shabaab might be a way forward that spares more human lives. But right now, the US seems stuck in a policy stalemate. Obama started the war in Somalia, Trump ramped it up further, and then he fully drew down troops on his way out of the office. Then Biden started up the strikes again, and has considered sending military advisors back. If there's a master plan in play here, it's incredibly unclear. What is clear is that after 16 years, billions of dollars spent, and an unknowable amount of lives lost, the state of Somalia is as fragile as ever. And if US policymakers haven't fully recognized it yet, they are hurtling headlong into another Vietnam and another Afghanistan.